Good morning and welcome. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome. We have a very full house, and I was just going to address people at the back who are standing. Um, the talks and all the activities here will be shown live in the first three rooms out there. So if you want to move and be more comfortable, you're very welcome. Otherwise, stay standing. Thank you. Welcome to Sweden, everyone, and welcome to East Impact 2023. I'm Patrick Furtabaus, Chairman of Positiva Gruppen, the local host of this conference. Positiva Gruppen is a national organization for people living with HIV in Sweden, and it was founded in 1985. In this video, you will meet a few of the NGOs working in the HIV field in Sweden. Hello, all delegates at AIDS Impact. Welcome to Sweden. My name is Peter, and I'm the chairman of Positiva Gruppen Norr. And it's the only patient-organized group for people living with HIV in the northern part of Sweden. And by northern part, I actually mean more than half of Sweden. Have a nice day in Stockholm. Läkare is a non-profit organization and part of the international network Medicine du Monde. We advocate for care based on needs for everyone. At our clinics around Sweden, we give care to migrants who lack access to healthcare. We work with HIV prevention and we offer HIV rapid tests. Since the mid-80s, Nuaxart is committed to the prevention of HIV and other bloodborne and sexual transmittable infections. We raise awareness and seek to reduce the vulnerability of people living with HIV. Nuaxark is an NGO in Sweden, and you're more than welcome to visit our helpline and support services around the country. Our website is nuaxark.org. Hello, we are Positiva Gruppen West, by and for people living with HIV. We are focused on peer support and rights, and based in western part of Sweden. We are happy to be part of AIDS Impact 2023. Bye! Hej från Noaxark Göteborg och Västra Götaland. Vi arbetar med hivprevention och för din sexuella hälsa. Hej från oss på Convictus uppsöksverksamhet för sjukvård och smittskydd. Hej! My name is Peter Sidlund Ponkel and I am the acting president of RFSL. RFSL is one of the oldest HIV and STD preventive organizations in Sweden and we organize members and activities uh, in the entire country from Malmö in the south to Kiruna in the north. Hey, and welcome. We are Joost and Anton, and we are working at Positiva Gruppen Sud, founded in 1987 and based in Malmö. We cover the south of Sweden and are passionate about helping people living with HIV. We focus on peer navigation, social activities and awareness campaign to reduce stigma. Have an inspiring conference! We at the HIV NGO Noaxark Stockholm would like to greet you all at the conference. A very warm... Bienvenue! Welcome! Karibuni! Alan was Alan. Bienvenidos! Well, welcome! welcome. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So good morning, everyone. My name is Lena Nilsson Schönesson, and I'm the chair of the AIDS Impact Conference 2023. Next to me here on the podium is Daniel Suarez and Jose Catalan, and they will introduce themselves eventually. <laughs> on behalf of the Swedish Local Board and the AIDS Impact International Board, I want to sincerely welcome you all to Stockholm, the city between the bridges, the Venice of the North. To paraphrase Martin Luther King, 
I had a dream to bring the AIDS Impact Conference to Stockholm for many, many years. <laughs> and now, my dream has come true. So to all of you, do feel most welcome to the 15th AIDS Impact Conference. And now I would like to hand over the floor to Daniel Soares. Thank you, Lina. My name is Daniel Soares, and I'm the operations manager at Positiva Gruppen, a co-chair of the local board. I'm delighted to welcome Desiree Junkrantz and Galit Andersson from the Public Health Agency of Sweden to the floor. Welcome. What a crowd. So my name is Desiree Junkrans, and on the behalf of the Public Health Agency of Sweden, I would like to really thank you for organizing this important conference here in Stockholm. So thank you, Lena, for your dream. As the head of unit for the unit for sexual health and HIV prevention at the agency, as a PhD HIV scholar, and as a person living with HIV, I really appreciate the theme Power for Action Now. Because there are many barriers and many challenging challenges in the society, here in Sweden as well, affecting the life with HIV. And this is aspect studied by the agency, which PhD and analyst Gellit Andersson will present. Thank you. I'm going to try to use the mic here. Thank you, Desiree, for a very nice introduction. And I'm very honored to be one of the first speakers here, and also a bit nervous about being one of the first speakers here. Um, yes, as Desiree uh, introduced briefly, I'm going to uh, present you a study that we are conducting at the Public Health Agency of Sweden. The mic is working OK? You can all hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, and this study is, um, I'm going to give you some uh, background uh, about why we conducted the study and some of, some of the results. Uh, I'm going to start by saying that we are still, uh, we're at the end uh, process of publishing this uh, report and we are hoping that this will be published by the end of the week, um, otherwise in the beginning of next week, we were rushing. Um, so some of the background, I'm going to do this so, so I can see my notes here. Uh, yeah, brief background about why we are conducting this study. So as many of you here know, and Sweden has very good uh, clinical outcomes or treatment outcomes for people living with HIV. It is um, estimated that around 99% of nearly 8,500 people uh, living with HIV, with diagnosed HIV, are uh, connected to healthcare, and of these, about 95% are virally suppressed. So, very good clinical outcomes, but we know, as Desiree mentioned briefly in her introduction, that people living with HIV face different types of challenges uh, related to, psych to their health in general, to psychosocial health, uh, and a stigma, nevertheless. We needed new update knowledge about uh, people living with HIV in Sweden. As some of you know, the Public Health uh, Agency of Sweden monitors the HIV, uh, the national HIV strategy. One of the strategy's uh, objectives is to minimize HIV-related stigma and so that people living with HIV can disclose their uh, status without risking being discriminated against. Uh, we also wanted to follow up a previous study that was conducted uh, during 2014 about the quality of life of uh, people living with HIV. This was a study conducted by Karolinska Institute and uh, uh, was assigned by the Public Health Agency of Sweden. 
Uh, and this survey that I'm presenting today is actually a part of a, a series of different studies that we conducted between 2021 and we are still uh, conducting them uh, during this year. Um, we are employing different methodologies. I'm going to speak a little bit about that later today in one of the sessions. Uh, we are employing qualitative methods and uh, survey methods, uh, registries and diverse methods in order to, to capture the, complex, the complexity of, of, of living with HIV among different groups and different issues. So briefly about uh, the methods of the survey, we have um, uh, conducted an online survey. So we used convenience sampling. Uh, we took a lot of help from civil society organization, many of those here, both organizing and present, uh, both with uh, giving information about our study in social medias, but also uh, we used some advertisements in different uh, channels. We also advertised about the study uh, with posters that we distributed across the country to clinics, both uh, primary care clinics and infection clinics. And the survey was anonymous. Uh, it was developed with collaboration with different NGOs and uh, experts in the field, both in the agency, but also uh, in the research field. And our uh, recruitment uh, efforts ended up with nearly 300 uh, respondents. Uh, what you can see here is the um, advertisement um, banners and posters that we used to recruit participants. Uh, so some of the characteristics of participants that uh, responded to the questionnaire, you can see here, um, the green bars represent the data that we have about people receiving care people living with HIV receiving care uh, from the INFCARE, the, the quality, qualitative registry that we use in Sweden. Um, and in the purple bars you can see um, respondents to the survey uh, according to different characteristics. And as you can see here that women are quite underrepresented in our uh, sample um, in comparison to the group of people living with HIV receiving care. Also, people uh, born in Sweden are overrepresented in comparison to people born outside of Sweden. When it comes to, to different age groups, we see that it's pretty representative. Um, but when we look at route of, route of transmission, we see that the people reporting MSM as route of transmission uh, are also slightly overrepresented in the sample. I will get back to that in our conclusions. But now I will um, show you some of the results. So um, one of the main questions that the survey um, addressed was quality of life and satisfaction with life. And what you can see here on this uh, graph is um, a, a scale from 0 to 10, where 0 represents very low quality of life and 10 represents very high quality of life, and this is the distribution of the responses. The green bars are, um, represent the results from a previous study from 2014-15, and the purple bars represent the current study. And as you can see here, it's pretty similar in results, and most participants rate their quality of life somewhere between 7 and 10, uh, which we interpreted as high quality of life. Mm, if there are any differences, are perhaps that some of the participants in the current study um, reported their quality of life quite high up here on the scale between 9 to 10. Uh, and this graph shows the mean scores of quality of life on this scale uh, across different groups uh, of, of participants. And um, basically, we, we didn't see any significant differences between uh, women and men, people born in Sweden and outside of Sweden, uh, and across different age groups, um, the, the mean score of quality of life was quite similar. Um, we saw that 
except from the questions about quality of life, we also raised uh, different questions relating to a life with HIV, both mental, related to mental health, but also to discrimination and stigma. And here uh, we used the HIV stigma scale in order to assess HIV stigma, which is here presented according to four different types of stigma. Disclosure concerns is the green bar. Uh, concerns about public attitudes are, is the purple bar. Negative self-image, or what we often refer to as internalized stigma, is here on the orange bar, and personalized or enacted stigma on the blue bar. Uh, and this scale is used... Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. This scale uh, goes from 3 to 12, where 3 represents low stigma and 12 represents high stigma, and this is the mean score of each of the stigma scales. And uh, what you can see is that um, the, the stigma that was experienced to the, to the largest extent was in relation to, in regards to disclosure concerns and to concerns about public attitudes, whilst the other types of stigma were experienced to a lower extent, even though they were definitely present. We also uh, uh, addressed issues related, uh, new issues that we haven't uh, explored previously in our uh, studies at the Public Health Agency. We asked about uh, intimate partner violence, and we found that uh, almost every fifth uh, of the participants reported experiences of, of intermittent, uh, intimate partner violence. We also asked about the different needs that uh, participants had in, in regards to their HIV care, but also in, in regards to psychosocial care and other type of healthcare needs. And we found that most, most of the needs uh, re related to HIV were fulfilled, while uh, different types of needs uh, were unfulfilled, for example, the need to talk about one's sex life, uh, the need to contact a psychologist or a counsellor, managing loneliness and managing stress. Our study has some limitations, as I mentioned before. Uh, the group is not representative to the, to the whole group of people, even with HIV. We have some underrepresented groups. And uh, that's why we also conducted different studies at the agency in order to, to manage this limitation. We need to, to have more in-depth analysis in order to see whether the, there are different relationships explaining those differences that I presented here today. What we conclude is that the majority of people living with HIV uh, in this study that we conducted report quite high quality of life and satisfaction with life, but we, we see that there are still some challenges uh, that many people living with HIV are facing. Uh, among those as, as HIV stigma and um, challenges related to mental health. And it's a diverse, diverse group with different trajectories and needs, uh, and uh, more attention is needed to be given to mental health issues, sexual health, and um, experience of intermittent, uh, intimate partner violence among people living with HIV. Thank you very much. And the report can be hopefully uh, on our website on Friday or Monday next week. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Pepe Catalan. I'm one of the founding members of its impact. Uh, little did we know over 30 years ago that we would still be here after 15 meetings and perhaps with many more to come, perhaps another 30 years await us. It's not a sign of us being desperate to hang on to it, it's a sign of how the problem continues and changes shape. So I'm, not, I'm sure that within a few more years, 20, 30 years, we will still be struggling. Having said that, I'd like to welcome Tala Al-Kurdi, Healthcare Commissioner for Stockholm. Well, thank you so much, dear all. As the healthcare commissioner of Stockholm County, I'm very happy to welcome you to Stockholm. I'm glad that we are able to provide you with some good and warm weather. But a word of advice, though, 
we're not that far from the Arctic Circle, so the nights are still cold. I've learned that the theme for this conference is power for action now. I think that's an excellent choice. HIV continues to present a big challenge. It's a fight that has not been won. It's a fight that we can only win together, even though there are unique circumstances in every country and or region. In Stockholm County, we have recently decided to expand access to PrEP to get the waiting times down. And we continue to explore more ways to improve the outreach of our HIV prevention efforts, for instance, among migrants. Every group and community must be included and feel included. While doing that, it's also necessary to raise the level of knowledge. In Sweden, for instance, only four out of 10 knows that undetectable equals untransmittable. That's far too few. We can do better. I would like, again like to thank you all for coming to Stockholm and for your life-saving work around the world. I hope this year's AIDS impact will be rewarding for you all, and that you will be energized to continue the fight, not only against the virus, but also against prejudice, stigma, and unequal access to healthcare. And a very special thank you to Positiva Gruppen for co-arranging this conference. You are an inspiration to us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tala. I would now like to welcome Andrea Hedin, Opposition Mayor for Stockholm. Welcome to Stockholm. And on behalf of the city, we're honored to host this important conference. My name is Andrea Hedin, and I'm Opposition Vice Mayor here in Stockholm. And I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to say a few words. Stockholm is an open, modern city that prides itself as being a hub for innovation and scientific discovery, with top universities and a vibrant life science ecosystem. I wish you a warm welcome to Stockholm. It is my firm belief that scientific advisement and discovery should communicate share and shared to the general public, especially when it comes to matters of health. Without knowledge, there is only ignorance which fosters taboos and unfair treatment of people. Sil uh, science and public perception come a long way since the AIDS crisis of the 1980s, but there are still, to this day, discriminating regulations in Sweden that remain based on historical events. Homo and bisexual men are still prohibited from blood donations in Sweden, even though sexual orientation should not have any bearing on the suitability of a blood donor. Canada and several countries have taken the step, and Sweden needs to do the same. Knowledge, education and preventive work are key elements in the fight against HIV and AIDS. Every year the Swedish government contributes public funds to the fight against HIV, which is distributed to non-profit organizations, country councils, regions and municipalities. The preventive work is done through the dissemination of knowledge, testing and advice. One of my main focuses as an elected uh, official 
is Stockholm's education system and schools. And to me, it's important that students have access to up-to-date information and an evidence-based curriculum when it comes to sexual health. Whenever someone seeks information, testing or treatment regarding these diseases and conditions, it's important that healthcare workers or school staff actively work counteract stigma. In Stockholm, a large part of the preventive work against HIV, AIDS and other transmitted diseases takes place in our youth clinics. It's important that the work spans all ages as it affects both the young and the older in Stockholm. Sweden, we have free testing and quick test answers at our youth clinics and other testing sites. Care and uh, possible treatment are also free of charge for the patient in Sweden. With these conditions, it's also important that people in connection with become sexually active also test themselves for HIV. But it's also important for those who come here and not have the opportunity to test themselves in their countries, receive information that they can do so here. Many of you are leading the way to a world which is free from HIV, for which I am grateful. The city of Stockholm serves almost 10% of the entire Swedish population with public services, so they weighs a heavy responsibility on our shoulders. I hope we can get back on track to strive for a healthier city. Once again, thank you for having me. I wish you a pleasant conference and enjoy your stay in Stockholm. Thank you. Now it's a great pleasure to introduce to you Alexandra Arien and Mohamed Youssef Valai, who will address our theme of the conference, Power of Action Now. My name is Mohammed. I'm 24 years old and I've been living with HIV since 2017. And my name is uh, Alexandra and I've been living with HIV. Okay, sorry. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> so my name is Alexandra. I am 28 years old and I've been living with HIV since 2018. It is a great honor for us as HIV activists, but also as professionals working in the HIV field to be standing here today and welcoming you to Sweden and Stockholm. Sweden is known as a country that stands up for human rights, being at the forefront when it comes to fighting inequalities. We were one of the first countries in the world um, to reach the 1990-90 targets, and today over 95% of people knowing they are HIV, possible, <laughs> HIV positive have undetectable viral loads. Despite Sweden being what, a role model when it comes to... Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> Despite Sweden being a role model in many ways, we do face the same challenges as many other countries. Although the first HIV diagnosis was given to a person in Sweden in 1982, still to this day we fight and struggle with limited knowledge, not just among the general public, but also among healthcare professionals. People are still being diagnosed far later than necessary because someone thinks they're not considered a risk group. I myself is an example of having had to argue to get an HIV test because the medical staff didn't think I met with the criteria for someone who has HIV. Prejudice and lack of information contribute to people avoiding or being denied getting tested. Despite Sweden having a small population, the country is big and distances are long. 
and we face challenges when it comes to equal health care for everyone living with HIV, regardless of who you are or where you live. Since the beginning of the epidemic, a lot has changed, and I'm in many ways grateful to be living with HIV today. I know that 30 years ago, I might not have survived, and I'm grateful for all the new knowledge, perspectives, and friends I've gained in the last five years. But still, as many of you know, the sky isn't without clouds. I worry about such things as getting older with HIV. What are the consequences of the chronic inflammation or the lifelong medication? How will it affect my health when I'm 90 or even as young as 60? Regarding getting older, I also worry about what will happen when I need assistance or elderly care. Will I be treated with respect or discriminated against because I'm HIV positive? Despite access to treatment and the fact that many people living with HIV in Sweden have a high quality of life, stigma and discrimination remains a challenge. During the 40-year-long epidemic, Sweden has unfortunately placed itself on the top countries when it comes to prosecuting people living with HIV. Still to this day, we have cases in court, including cases where no transmission has occurred. In Sweden, HIV is included in the Communicable Diseases Act. HIV-positive people are required to inform their sexual partners of their infection unless they have an undetectable viral load and their HIV doctor has removed this obligation. In 2008, UNAIDS published a statement saying that UNAIDS does not support a legal obligation to disclose one's HIV-positive status. We, just like UNAIDS, believe the obligation is stigmatizing and counteracts HIV prevention. We would like Sweden to follow international recommendations and to remove the obligation about one's HIV status for all people living with HIV in Sweden, regardless of viral loads. Working with topics related to pregnancy and parenting, I meet people living with HIV who struggle with both their own worries and that of others when it comes to regarding safety when it comes to parenting, pregnancy and infant feeding. A patient-centered and evidence-based care that allows for shared decision-making as well as a harm reduction approach to is issues such as breastfeeding should be a matter of course. In the case of harm reduction, as well as with recommendation when, remove, when it comes to removing obligation to disclose one's HIV status, Sweden ignores the recommendations from international organizations such as World Health Organization and UNAIDS. As you can see, Sweden faces challenges that are both similar to and different from those of many other countries. Therefore, it feels great to be standing here today knowing we have three days ahead of us filled with the latest research, interesting discussion, and a chance to share experiences, knowledge, and different perspectives on the subject of HIV. Power for Action Now is the theme of AIDS Impact 2023. Focus and determination will be required to ensure that HIV continues to feature on the worldwide agenda. Let's make these upcoming days an event that puts HIV on the public agenda. We thank you all for being here and we are looking forward to these upcoming days and we're hoping to make them count again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mohammed and Alexandra. And the last item of the opening session is the panel discussion of living with HIV in Sweden. A discussion will be moderated by Ronja Sanna's daughter, the communications manager of Positiva Gruppen. Please, Ronja, take the floor. Thank you so much. No. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow, there we go. <laughs> Is it worth an applause? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so 
thank you everyone for being here today. And actually, I'm not going to stand here on my own. I would like to welcome a few more people up on stage. So uh, I'm really proud to be standing here today with these great activists. Please join me on stage. Jaya Godwiller, Steve Schoerquist. I, I don't know where we are in the audience, so just uh, join me on stage. Steve Schoerquist. Vin Phillips, Ingvar Sonnegöjen, and also Ophelia Hanyama. And uh, my plan is that we will share a couple of microphones if we can all make them work. So uh, we'll, we'll see, otherwise we'll share one. Let's try this one. Oh, I think it sounded this one now. Yeah? Okay, great. Perfect. So if you two share that one and the two of you share this one, yeah, great. Okay. And is this is this a good like standing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We we'll try this one. I'll stand behind you, Lena. <laughs> so um, I've just introduced you by name. So could you all please tell me a bit more about yourself? Who are you, and for how long have you been living with HIV? Starting with Jaya. Well, my name is Yaya Godwiller, and I'm originally from Myanmar, a country which is in crisis right now. And then, uh, well, I've been living with HIV for so many years, and then, um, yeah, I've been resettled here in Sweden like a, like 14 months ago. Nice to meet you all. And my name is Steve Schoerqvist, and I have lived with HIV since 1987. I feel like an old elephant. <laughs> um, I'm uh, working daily as in Church of Sweden as a hospital chaplain, a deacon, in one of the emergency hospitals in Stockholm. And I feel every week that I'm using my long-term experience for being HIV positive. Uh, hi, my... Uh can you hear me? Just put it a bit closer, like closer this. Like that. Perfect. Uh, my name is Ophelia. I was born in Zambia. I was diagnosed with HIV in 1990, I think. Um, I'm Swedish Zambian. I, now I live partly here and partly in Zambia. And I'm a mother of two kids and two grandchildren. Thank you so much. So, hello. Uh, my name is Vin Phillips Ingvar Songyan. I'm born in Vietnam, but I grew up in Sweden, and I've been diagnosed 2013. Oh yeah, I'm 28, so I was 18 years old. And I work for an association working against incest and sexual abuse uh, in childhood, and also studied to become a gender scientist. Thank you, everyone. So, <laughs> ah, thank you. I would like to start with a question uh, after hearing Alexander and Mohammed speaking, what are your initial thoughts and reflections? Uh, would you like to start, Vin? Yeah, uh, I would like to thank them for like raising up the concerns in Sweden and how it is to live here. And I do agree with everything they said. It's like we have a lot of knowledge in the country, but also like a lot of non-knowledge, and it still affects many people living here. Ophelia? Uh, I, I, I feel like I've been standing here not moving from 1991. Uh, it's sort of addressing the same issues I was answering to 30 years ago. So I, I don't know if, I mean, I know I have a quality of life, I'm still standing, but I don't know if I'm standing actually. Um, I don't know if we are doing a lot or we are not doing anything. It, I, I, don't know, I don't even know how to answer that question, but I hope that we, we might change some things soon before I die, I guess. Steve. Yeah, um, um, uh, thank you for addressing the situation in Sweden. And um, my biggest problem these days are that I'm facing to get old. I wasn't expected that. And um, that is something I have to work really much with, to think and feel and communicate, of course, with friends and others. Um, <clears throat> I'm very disappointed right now about the HIV care, 
because they sent us out from the clinics. So uh, I had to go to my general, general practitioners, uh, GP, and um, it's a system. Sounds good, but it's not functioning. Most of them are saying to me, we don't know anything about your disease or your in infection. And that makes me wor worried. After 35 years of struggling, I wish I could have a peaceful life the rest of my life. Uh, well, to me, as a new person here in Sweden, and then I've been uh, looking at the presentation earlier, and then uh, there has been a lot of positive things that, like, there are only a few people, I mean, like, 8,500 comparing to what we have had in our country, like, more than, uh, like, almost, like, 300 uh, thousands of people living with HIV and then not a lot of people are getting access to treatment then here is like we have reached the goals and everything and I think that it is in a better position than other parts of the world but then what can be better here is that uh, more trainings to the healthcare professional because sometimes um, the healthcare professional, in my experience, I'm based on my, what I have experienced so far when getting treatments and everything here, and it is that sometimes there are questions that do not necessary to be asking the persons, like what kind of drugs you are taking and why you are taking this. This kind of things can be like uh, impacted on the dignity of a person and then this is not necessary in my opinion. And the other thing is that we are here talking about it, but a lot of uh, knowledge sharing among the communities are needed. If things are going on within the migrant community, especially people are not know w what is going on. And then like, I think in my opinion, like to know your status is very important. Not many people knows about this, their status. And then um, safer set practices, I think, is like an issue within like uh, like the community as well. So like these are uh, my experience that I have like overcome these days. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Daya. <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to applaud, of course. Um, as also mentioned in the speech by Alexander and Mohammed, we have in Sweden this uh, obligation to to d disclose your HIV status uh, if you're if you're not having undetectable viral loads and your doctor has haven't removed this obligation. Uh, so I I would like you to reflect on this. Like, how has this obligation to inform affected you, and what do you think about it? Would anyone would like to start? Okay, so I can start. So uh, for me, it was very like hard to feel that I needed to tell people because I was like 18 and I moved to a new city and I was all alone by myself. And I felt like an obligation to tell people and I didn't know much about HIV when I got diagnosed because I didn't learn much in school about it. So I felt lonely and it felt so like such a heavy thing. So I thought I would be living like alone by myself because I didn't want to tell anyone. And when I did start telling people, people got scared. And that I got scared because I didn't feel that like, comfortable telling people or living with it. But when, and also like when I didn't need to disclose it anymore, I still felt like a need to be honest with myself and be like proud of who I am and that it doesn't affect me. So it wouldn't affect other people around. So then make them feel safe as well. And it took me so long time for me to feel safe and be open about it. And today I'm open about it because I don't want to have a conversation every time I would want to date someone. Every time like, when do I tell them? How do I tell them? What if I don't tell them? And it just also makes it things more serious, like when you need to tell people. Like, if you're on the first date, should I tell them on the first date? And it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't go smoothly. So for me, it affects like, the mental health a lot, and that's why I decided to be more open about it. So I couldn't like, need to think about it and talk about it all the time. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Ophelia, would you like uh, to? And I, I think it just takes to a lot of responsibility. So you, it, it sort of ha it's my responsibility somehow. That's what I get from it, that I have to teach someone before I go to the dentist. Like, before you touch me, 
Let me tell you a bit about myself. So I'm teaching the healthcare guy with the knowledge that I got from another doctor, which I'm assuming he should have. So I'm, if I have 45 minutes with this doctor, 35 minutes I'm teaching this. So my teeth have become, <laughs> and I can now have 15 minutes, let's check your teeth. <laughs> I mean, who does that? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, before we have sex, hold on a minute. I'm a woman. However, I have a disease that you have to know about. I mean, we only have one hour. <laughs> so 55 minutes, I'm teaching this guy. <laughs> and the game for sex is five minutes. I'm like, <laughs> we're losing time. It's a quick game. So I think that it's your own responsibility to find out, to know about yourself. Let's go on with the game. You, you read, I'll read. Let's start from, hey, my name is Sophia. Go straight to what we, are, we met for. But let's not, don't give me too much. It's enough for me to take my medication, to teach the Swedish uh, community, to be scared of ending up in cold. I mean, that's a bit too much. I've been doing this for 35 years. I don't have so much time left. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Philia. Oh. Well, uh, I tried to be open for the first uh, time. I moved from Gothenburg to Stockholm. That was a consequence because I wanted to be opened. So I took the challenge to, to confront sex partners to say I'm HIV positive. That was also a good strategy to me to don't having with uh, afraid people. To <laughs> I, I, uh, I have no use of them if they were if they they were afraid of me. So, but I think uh, the medical um, care and the research knew for so many years before it was okay to say, now you don't need to inform your partner. And that was so many years they took from us, knowing that we couldn't Im infect other people. Mm. That's my, I think that's a shame. I think that disclosing your status to your partner is not only your responsibility. Like when you have your intercourse, that means that you both are responsible for it. It is so a mutual responsibility in my opinion, right? So you just do not need to disclose, but then you have to be responsible for all your actions. And then we're just talking only about HIV, HIV, what about HPV, chlamydia, other uh, like sexually transmitted diseases? For example, I have to be worried about this. Like, you know, if uh, a person I have seen is not like we do not know the status. So I think that like having safer sex option is better. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you. I just wanted to check how are we on time? Or five minutes left. Oh, time is running out. I have so many questions. <laughs> but uh, I would like to uh, um, ask both uh, Ophelia and Steve, since uh, you're both longtime activists as well as longtime survivors. Uh, you have both written books and shared your story in many different uh, medias and so on. So, uh, starting with you, Steve. How was it being diagnosed with HIV in Sweden in 1987? And could you describe, like, how have you experienced the change in attitudes and knowledge? That was a big question. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, know. Well, let's start with the 80s. Um, I was um, traveling a lot. Uh, uh, I went to New York and to US. And uh, part of the 80s, I was also working abroad in Saudi Arabia with um, rehabilitation for handicapped children and lived for a short time in the US and came back to a scenario that was um, terrible when I started because I came home back to Gothenburg and 
people told me, do you know that Nicholas and Lars has died? And suddenly I was confronting uh, HIV in, on a personal level. And that was terrible. Uh, and I started to get information and, uh, but I also read uh, tabloids and papers and magazine and um, at the end I was more afraid of other people and the prejudice and uh, lack of information. It was more terrible than to get in uh, than to get an HIV positive test to me. That's why I moved from Gothenburg and said, my old life took an end here. Now I will start on a new platform. And I think today also that you don't die only for lack of medical care. You can die from guilt and shame. True. And uh, yeah, it's been a hell of a journey, I think. Um, but to be up front, and I've been writing books, and uh, my finest title is to actually to be an HIV activist. And uh, I'm proud of that. And uh, we have more to do. Thank you, Steve. Ophelia, what would you answer to the same question? Like, how has it been all these years? How was it in the early 90s? I, I think in the early 90s, when I was diagnosed, I mean, it was, it, you, you had a few years to live. So it's more planning how to die, what music, funerals. I, I mean, you, I ready to go. And then a few years later, someone says, oh, now we have some medicine for you. Say, okay, <laughs> now change of plan. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, okay, now maybe it's getting married, having children, go back to living with other people. And you also don't trust the drugs. How long am I going? We well, start taking it, but you still think, okay, let's see how far this will take me. Uh, so it's, for me, I had seen AIDS before. I, I come from Zambia, I've seen people die, so I have a whole different picture. It was about reading, it was about seeing it. You have families, we are burying someone every day. So you just say, oh, now it's my turn. So I don't know how long. So I've had a very different way of looking at it. And then the writing the book was to avoid to sit one to one and say, hey, my name is Ophelia, I'm living with HIV. Hi, write a book, tell everybody. The minute they meet you, hi, this is me. You read my book, so we're done. So I had to find, <laughs> I had to find a shortcut to save time and take care of me. So do it once for all. So we cut this, don't say, don't tell anyone that I didn't tell you so. I was on TV, so you saw me. So I had to find a more comfortable, I think I, I sort of turned HIV to, to save my time. So it, for me, I have maybe very, it's ironic, I do have a lot of neg negative things, but I decided because of time to pick the best out of it for me and for my family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Since we just, I think, got maybe two minutes left, yeah, great. Uh, I would like to direct uh, the last question to you, Vin and, and Jaya. Uh, what would you like everyone here in here to, to take with them when they like dig into all the interesting uh, stuff in this conference? Like, yeah, what important message do you have for these upcoming days? Jaya. Uh, well, as I have said earlier, my message will be like knowing your status and be responsible for the actions. And then um, I, I think that we have done so many years in this activism and as well as to combat the HIV and then doing the HIV prevention and care works. And then I, I think that we should be moving forward and like we should also be kind of like firm on our advocacy and then yeah, do our work with our hearts. Thanks. Thank you. Vin, what would you answer to this question? What would you like, like everyone in here to, to take with them these upcoming days? I just want everyone to stay open and positive for a change and that you think about all the people who don't seek the information, how you can reach out to all the people who don't seek like, the information so they also get the knowledge. Because it's important that they have the knowledge to make a change. 
Thank you. I, I really wished we have had, had had like an hour or something. It would have been great talking to you uh, more, but you will be here for the upcoming days, so just grab them. They are, have, have super interesting things to say, as you see. And I hope uh, you found this conversation inspiring for the next upcoming days. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, all uh, great speakers talking about their own private life and sharing it with you all. And I do very, very much appreciate that. And uh, I think it's also given you some kind of insight what it means living with HIV in Sweden. It's not only roses, by no means. There are a lot of whatever you call it, you know, <laughs> on the rosebuds, you know. So there is a lot to fight and work hard on. So uh, I'm sure that this conference will indeed give us all a lot of inspiration, both here in Sweden, but also all over the world. And uh, I think we start right now, but also I do welcome you all to our welcome reception tonight. And uh, we gather in the lobby at 6.15, and then we have to take a walk for 20 minutes. <laughs> so you better put on the right shoes, not the high heels. <laughs> that will be problematic. Uh, but anyway, you will walk along the waterfront. It's a nice view, and you will reach uh, Ersta ter Terrassen. And where we, there we will have some wine and some small sandwiches and enjoy ourselves and do a lot of networking, hopefully. And you will find new friends and or colleagues and also old colleagues and a lot of hugs and kisses on the cheeks. <laughs> okay, so you are most welcome to the reception tonight and enjoy rest of the day. See you tonight.